I don't know as the moon had anything to do with it in the beginning. It sure as hell didn't mean much to me. I was happy as a pig just test flying jets. As for rockets, <laughs> they weren't for flying, they were for fireworks. But it all changed pretty damn quick. We got into a race. Putting a man on a rocket became the most important thing in the world. And I figured it ought to be me. That's a test pilot's nature. He wants to be first. The finish line. That's what the moon was. A brand new runway. Fate, luck, the Russians, whatever it was, it put us in the spotlight. And flying the thing was only half the job. The other half was making it look easy. And that's the part no one saw. It was never easy, never safe, never routine. I guarantee you never heard the real story. It was a hell of a ride. Griffin, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's me, Slayton, Major Donald K. Deke to my friends. It was 1957, and I thought I had the greatest job in the world, test pilot. Then out of the blue, I got selected for some crazy experiment called Project Mercury. For me and six other pilots, it turned into the trip of a lifetime. Before it ended, one of us even walked on the moon. Some of it made the headlines, but to me, the best part never got told. I was in the middle of it all, from the very beginning to the end. Now I can finally tell it the way I saw it. I remember it as clear as yesterday. It's been a lot of years and a lot of miles since I met these guys, my friends and comrades. Al Shepard, John Glenn, Gordo Cooper, Scotty Carpenter. We started out with one thing in common. All we ever wanted to do was fly. Just a farm boy from Wisconsin, but I'd had flying on the brain since I was a kid. After the war, I found a way to keep going faster and higher, test flying. Sure, it got a little hairy sometimes. Dealing with unknowns, things always go wrong. get into trouble, but the best can get out. See, a test pilot with a problem doesn't think, I've got 10 seconds until I crash. He thinks, hell, I got 10 seconds. I bet I can save this thing. Well, maybe you can't, but you think you're the best, even if you die trying to prove it. Faster, farther, higher. That's test flying. Then overnight, the game changed. Faster, farther, higher no longer meant wings and wheels. It meant rockets. Now there was a chance to fly into space and into history. We all wanted it. But out of hundreds of test pilots, it came down to seven astronauts. And there was a lot more to being an astronaut than we realized, like press conferences. With so many to choose from, I figured these seven would be the best damn test pilots in the country. It's my pleasure to introduce to you. And I can but I looked around and I couldn't gentlemen. believe my eyes. I thought, either I don't belong here or some of these other guys don't. Malcolm S. Carpenter. Scotty was kind of a philosophical type, a bit of a poet. Not exactly the typical test pilot. Leroy G. Cooper. Gordo matched the basics, but I'd heard he was a real hot dog. Had a tendency to be a little flaky. John H. Glenn. John had gotten a lot of press for setting a cross-country speed record, but he was over age, and he really didn't meet the education requirement. Virgil I. Grissom. 
Gus Grissom. Now here was a real test pilot. He'd flown in Korea and he was a damn good engineer. A little short, though. Walter M. Shira. Wally was a real joker, and nobody enjoyed Wally's sense of humor more than Wally. But he was Navy, and I respect anyone who flies off carriers. Alan B. Shepard. Over the years, this guy, Shepard, would end up being my best friend. But then he was competition. I could tell he'd be the guy to beat. Donald K. Slayton. And, of course, me, the best of the seven. Wouldn't be a good test pilot if I wasn't sure of that. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. I was happy I'd made it and ready to work. But why all the publicity? We hadn't done anything yet. And the questions had nothing to do with flying. Why is it that family men were picked instead of bachelors? Don, as a bachelor, answer that, please. <laughs> Uh, Walt, the only thing I can say is that the, uh, the medical statistics prove that married men live longer than bachelors. And we... <laughs> Here we were, military men, and they're asking us to get warm and personal. Uh, let's, the question is, what is the motivation of these men? Oh, man, I wanted to be anywhere but there. Okay, my full name is Donald K. Slayton, and my hometown is Sparta, Wisconsin. And uh, age I was nervous as hell and a long way from smooth, and, uh, but the, the guy next to me laid it right out. I have no problems at home. My family's in complete agreement. <laughs> <laughs> well, there it was. Nobody was going to stop Al Shepard. But John Glenn understood that moment better than any of us. These people were looking for heroes. And John gave them just what they wanted. I think we are very fortunate that we have should we say, been blessed with the talents that have been picked for something like this. And I think we'd be almost remiss in our duty if we didn't make full use of our talents. It was like he'd been cast for the role. John understood what the rest of us missed. America was in a Cold War. We seven were carrying the flag in a race with the Russians, a race that started with Sputnik. Sputnik, the first man-made object in orbit. If the Russians could put a satellite over our cities, then a bomb might be next. Their own people at 9.40, I believe it was, it passed over Detroit, and at one minute later, it passed over Washington. This is what 18,000 miles an hour is. They do not tell the sober ramifications of what Russia has done for herself as a world power. They've been operating since World War II under the illusion that this was basically a peacetime situation. This isn't peacetime. This is all-out war. People were scared. If Russia could do it, why not us? What about an American rocket? As of now, the United States is strong. Our scientists assure me that we are well ahead of the Soviets, both in quantity and in quality. President Eisenhower was on the hot seat. I asked you, sir, uh, what are we going to do about it? His answer was NASA, a program for manned space flight. That's where we came in. NASA needed pilots. The first word of mouth on Project Mercury made it sound pretty dumb. I can recall my own reaction when a bunch of idiots. Arrive in this wife. big auditorium at the Pentagon with about 70 guys, two engineers and a shrink trying to tell us about how exciting it would be to get in a capsule on top of a rocket. And I said, where the hell's the no desk? Then they make us feel better. They said, well, uh, don't worry, we're gonna send a chimpanzee first. Where the hell is the no desk? <laughs> but the more we heard about it, the better it sounded. Manned space flight. It just might work. And if it did, every one of us wanted that first ride, especially the guy sitting right next to me. Alan B. Shepard, son of a career military officer, Naval Academy graduate, test pilot, and husband of Louise. In the early days, all I knew about Al Shepard was that he was a hot jock in a test plane, on the fast track to Admiral Stripes, and not a guy to stand in front of unless you're looking to get run over. In fact, I'm glad I wasn't around that Friday when Al read the New York Times about Project Mercury and thought he'd been passed over. Why am I not on the list of guys who have received telegrams? 
And I thought, certainly they could not have overlooked me, one of the great test pilots of the Navy. So I was in a terrible mood at the end of the day. Uh, drove home, spend the weekend at Virginia Beach. My poor wife suffered, the children and the dogs and everybody felt the wrath of Shepard to some degree. I was still totally out of it when I went back uh, to the office on Monday morning. And I was in the process of reading the New York Times again when a yeoman came in the office, said, uh, Commander, uh, this is a dispatch which came in Friday, and for some reason we didn't get it to you. Well, I looked at it, and I practically kissed the guy because here was the invitation to go back to Washington to try out to become an astronaut. But it was only an invitation to try out. Hundreds of pilots got them. Before anyone got selected, they had to go through testing the likes of which we'd never seen before. Hey, which, which test uh, they like, please? And it's, it's rather difficult to pick one because if, uh, if you figure how many openings there are on the human body and how far you can go in any one of them. And... <laughs> you gave it away. <laughs> Now, you, an you answer which one would be the toughest for you. test that I ever experienced was the time when this uh, wasn't even a doctor he was just a, a corpsman of some sort put this needle in my in my hand here this meaty part of my hand and then put electricity into it which balled up my hand and hurt like uh, like you know, the devil and then he was taking pictures on an oscilloscope up there which the thing failed somehow if, you, if they could smoke and everything like that and so when my hand was balled up he called up and wanted to get a TV technician to go fix the thing I see you brought your uh, Air Force pressure suit with you. Yes. It doesn't look awfully comfortable. It isn't. Sergeant Cusey, will you stand up and move around? When they got done with our bodies, they started on our minds. That is respecting to his mobility to some extent. Uh, Dr. Verotval, uh, I believe that Dr. Struvhol referred to you as a psychologist. That's right. Now, isn't it rather surprising that a psychologist should be investigating uh, a physical condition like weightlessness? Every time, every one of us that went in to see the psychiatrist, when we had those Rorschach tests, you know, the, and we were looking at uh, nothing but a blank piece of paper, and she gave me a a sheet of white paper, and she said, well, what does that look like? And I said, oh, that's easy. And he says, I, I want you to just look at this card, and you visualize the story, and then and, and tell me what it is you see. And I said, that's a, a, a blonde woman dressed in a white leotard on a white horse riding through, desperately through a snowstorm. She said, it's not really. His, where do you see that? We always saw feminine attributes in there, feminine anatomy, uh, uh, anatomy in there, only to show how masculine we were. And the psychiatrist thought we were all sex maniacs, but he passed us. <laughs> so I took hold of the thing, and then I turned it over, and I said, you gave it to me upside down, and that did it. I it was over it right there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe subconsciously I was trying to not get in the program. <laughs> we were well patients being looked at by sick doctors. Hundreds were tested. Only seven made it. But competing for the title astronaut was nothing compared to what was about to begin. The competition for the first ride and the title, First Man in Space.
These guys look pretty tame now, sitting around chewing over old times. But I knew them back when being number one was all they lived for. They were, they were very competitive among each other because they each wanted to get their ride. And there was only so many people who could ride a Mercury spacecraft. We worked as a team, but to get that first flight, we each had to prove we were tougher, smarter, and better prepared than the other six. All of a sudden, now here you've got seven guys trying to fly the same airplane. And boy, uh, there was competition. And I think everyone sensed it uh, in almost everything we did. I remember one of the first meetings we ever had with Bob Gilruth, who ran the program at that time. He said we had enough doubts about the program. We could go back to our services where we had come from and, and no questions asked, and that was it. All we had to do was say the word. And, uh, of course, nobody ever did. We were fighting to get positions, not to go back someplace. It was just a matter of personal pride to know that you were the best and that you were going to make the first flight. There is rivalry, of course, but uh, the Navy people were the best. There's no doubt about that. And the fact that we had three Air Force people with us was purely political and one token Marine, uh, which that's all right. The Marines are part of the Navy anyway. In this group, if you had a weakness, you never, never let it show. I was doing great until Carpenter got a bright idea. As I recall, it was at my suggestion that we took scuba training at Little Creek with the UDT fellow, tough program, and they put us through some real paces. We're sort of cavorting around this nine-foot deep pool, and all of a sudden we look, and here's Slayton down the bottom. The guy couldn't swim. Gus and I dive down and bring Deke up to the surface. They, they admitted Slayton was probably the best scuba diver of all, because he'd go to the bottom right away. <laughs> His wife, Marge, uh, remarked that uh, he had been home practicing in the kitchen sink, trying to inhale from his mouth and exhale through his nose in the water. But he did that whole training and didn't tell anybody that he didn't know how to swim. Sure, it's funny now, but the pressure to perform was nonstop. We needed to let off a little steam. We weren't going to let the fact that we were astronauts keep us from having fun but some of us had different definitions of fun. I think while the other astronauts sometimes were a little bit more mischievous and things they did, and John stood out as the all-American boy in that particular group. John Glenn didn't appreciate our kind of fun. One night he made that very clear. Well, you know, frankly, uh, when we were discussing extracurricular activities, if you will, I thought to myself, well, gosh, why is this even coming up? Why is it being discussed? Uh, doesn't everyone have the right to do what they want to do? John said, uh, knock it off, kind of. You guys are having too much fun. John came down on us much like a mother hen, so we didn't like that too much. I was afraid at that time that if uh, there was any very severe publicity about the group, negative publicity, that it could affect the kind of, of uh, of support funding out of the Congress, it could uh, it could really harm us somewhat. So I was a little bit concerned about it. Extracurricular activities was a tempest in the teapot compared to the issue of who would fly first. When we finally heard, it was typical fighter pilots in a room, each convinced he's the best. But six of us got some very bad news. We were asked by Bob Gilruth to stay on a little later than we normally would have. Uh, we sat there in our magnificent office, seven steel desks in one room, and waited and waited. And there wasn't a heck of a lot of conversation. No introductions, no pleasantries. He said, well, we've been watching you guys now for almost a couple of years. And Bob didn't miss words. He said, uh, Glenn, Grissom, and Shepard are selected for the first Redstone flight. It turned out to be Al, and Gus was to get the second flight, and John was to be back up for both. It was an emotion, an emotional high, because 
of those seven equally qualified guys, I had been picked to make the first flight. I, I can recall really feeling deflated, because this is one of those rare times when you didn't make the mark, at least I hadn't. And here were Slayton, Carpenter, Cooper, and myself, second team. A very, very traumatic feeling. Not being first was bad enough, but not even placing in the first three. I couldn't believe it. Because they all came forward and shook my hand and congratulated me, uh, some with less enthusiasm than others. It was time to put everything else aside and do the job. Al and his backup, John, got to work preparing for the flight. Al was ready to take his seat in the cockpit and his place in history. Unfortunately, the seat in the cockpit was temporarily occupied. President, I guess we, uh, this uh, chimpanzee who was flying in space uh, took off at 10.08. He reports that everything is perfect and working well. <laughs> at one point, there were something like 20 or 30 animal flights. So many that uh, Bob Gilruth, the Senate director, suggested once we should move the program to the French Cameroons, where all the chimps live, and just launch there. Go out and pull one out of a tree and stick him in a capsule. We found all the jokes real funny. Time to feed the chimp. Spam in a can. Shepherd, Grissom, and Glenn, the link between monkey and man. We hadn't signed on to fly standby while Bonzo pushed the outside of the envelope. At one time, uh, this uh, uh, Al, he gave him a bunch of static, you know, and I kind of mentioned to him, I said, you know, Al, if you don't like it, we can go back to somebody who works for banana peels. And uh, he kind of threw an ashtray at me at that time. Chimps don't talk back, test pilots do. We knew until we were flying, the program and our lives would be out of our control. We'd seen enough monkey business and we were ready to go. Then the last chimp flight before Al had a problem. And Werner von Braun, our German rocket genius, wanted one more test. The escape tower fired, but it stayed hooked on to the, to the capsule. So the monkey got a... A lot, a lot higher and a lot further than he should have gone. And we said, well, heck, we know what happened. They figured out which switch it was. We said, we're ready to go. You remember all that discussion? Yeah. They said, let's go. But the extra test delayed the schedule. The first man in space wouldn't be named Al or Gus or John or even Deke. It would be Yuri, Yuri Gagarin, a Russian cosmonaut. I'll never forget the Al's reaction. He he said, "Look at that goddamn thing!" And he he hit his hand so hard I thought he was going to break it. The public didn't like losing to a Russian any more than Al did. It means they're getting ahead of us, and we certainly need to start working hard to catch up. I think it's about time the America woke up and did something about it. The Russians were beating us. NASA was dragging its heels. We were starting to look bad. And uh, may I ask what that's called? Is that the crash helmet? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> uh, after you leave the moon, sir, when you come back to Earth, where will you be landing? I am going to be landing in Nevada. Mm -hmm. In the state of Nevada? In the state of Nevada, yes. Then you're convinced that they will get you back to Earth? I am convinced that they will get me back to Earth. <laughs> Just how far into it? <laughs> That's what I'm not convinced about. Well, surely they've provided something to break your fall. Oh, yes, the estate of Nevada. <laughs> but Al Shepard was no reluctant astronaut. He couldn't wait to be the first American in space. It takes a whole lot of people to build a new flying machine. But when it's finally ready, only one climbs into the cockpit. Now the world could only watch. America was taking its first step toward the moon. Alan B. Shepard was about to ride the rocket. 
Early in the morning of Alan's flight, I went in to the crew quarters uh, and awakened him. And he's calm, cool, and collected. Yeah, I was scared to death. In contradistinction to Alan, I was probably uh, the most frightened person on the pad because this was a friend of mine, a close, near and dear friend of mine, who was putting his life on the line. I was aware only of the people around me. The medics were going to pat me on the head and finally let us go fly. On the surface, it wasn't going to be much of a flight. A suborbital, we called it. Just 15 minutes from launch till splashdown. But it was 15 minutes of pure unknowns. The launch, the G-forces, re-entry. Any one of them could kill Al. He may have been cool, but the rest of us were more than a little nervous. I have seen people throw up on the launch consoles in the, uh, in the blockhouse because no one wanted to be responsible for a hold or responsible for any kind of a mess up. When the Russians flew Gagarin, they kept it a secret until he was back safe. But Al Shepard was going to make it or break it on live TV in front of millions. The 33-ton rocket is poised to hurl America's first man into space at 5,000 miles per hour. Alan Shepard will rocket to 115 miles above the Earth. He will weigh nearly 1,000 pounds from the punishing acceleration of his giant booster rocket. And you know the old desire of all pilots that when you walk up to the airplane, you always kick the tires just to be sure they're not flat. This particular uh, rocket I was never going to see again. So I just stopped as I approached it, looked up into the glare of the spotlights, and, and took a look at the rocket. Uh, sort of uh, another way of kicking the tires, so to speak. All of a sudden you realize, hey, wait a minute, the next one that we launch, it better not get blown up because uh, there's somebody in you know. It's not just uh, some monkeys, you know, or chimps, but it's a man. People have always said, how does it feel to be in a history book? And I said, listen, when you're sitting on the top of some six million pounds of high explosive, <laughs> the last thing in your mind is being a page in a history book. The countdown dragged on and on. Waiting wasn't easy for any of us, but it was worse for the man locked in the can. Okay. I can't hear you on this goddamn. Hear you on this phone. Hey, watch your language. We're being recorded every place. We are standing by to resume the count. Reporters, photographers, and technicians here are more excited than anybody. The rocket is poised and ready. Shepard is ready. The missile range and recovery forces are ready. The 83-foot tall Mercury Redstone rocket with astronaut Alan Shepard aboard. He's been there several hours now. Up on top of Al was beginning to wish he hadn't had that second cup of coffee. I soon discovered that the bladder was uh, getting relatively full. And, and I said, well, why don't you ask Werner if uh, I can open the door and get out and, uh, and go to the bathroom, like a normal person would. And I expected a normal answer. Werner says, no, the astronaut will stay in the nose cone. There will be no door opening. So I told the folks that, uh, that I was going to relieve myself on the spot and uh, they said oh he can't do that he was short circuit everything well i said well how about turning the power off so they deliberated a few moments and finally turned off the power i relieved myself and uh it uh, started to dry out so i said okay i think you guys can turn the power back on and we'll take the risk of a shock <laughs> I finally said, well, I'm getting tired of this. Why don't you tell them to light this damn candle, because I'm ready to go. T-minus 
on his own. After years of getting ready, there was nothing we could do but wait. Coming unraised and it looks good. This is it. He's on the way down. At about this time. You should hear the newsmen here right now. They are absolutely screaming and shouting. They've been jumping up and down, holding their hands over the head in a great sign of victory because this flight is just about at its end. It is a tremendously successful thing. They're kissing each other and hugging and jumping up and down. I can take any second. Astronaut Shepard will be walking on the deck of the aircraft carrier. And we will have completed a most historic event in the history of man's conquest of new frontiers. Then as we're flying toward the carrier, and the entire deck of the carrier was covered with sailors. And the deck was just covered with these guys. Uh, the fact that the carrier had been my home, part of my life. The sailors had been part of my life. And here were these guys, the first guys to welcome me back. This was the first sense in which I had of how people felt about what I had done. That had to have been the most emotional carrier landing which I ever made. This is the beginning of a fantastic new age when two nations are marching into space in a competition with one another. America has finally forged back tremendously in this particular shot. Gus and I met Al after the flight. It felt good. I wanted that first ride myself. Hell, <laughs> each of us did. And we knew the Russians were still way ahead. But Al was one of our own, and he'd put us in the game. We were there because that was what we were trained to do. We were test pilots. But we'd become more than test pilots. Now we were astronauts. When test pilots risk their lives, it's a nine to five job and hardly anybody notices. But the Mercury astronauts had an audience of millions. We all knew getting that first flight would make Al a big man. But we had no idea how big. Back to Washington for this parade, and we're down there, and I remember we were all sort of wide-eyed about it, just like the excitement of the crowd and everybody when we were in the parade just sort of washed over you. The crowd behind us has just now caught a glimpse of Alan Shepard, and you can hear what they're doing about it. I understand Mr. Shepard is a retiring man, doesn't like to make public appearances, doesn't mind being lofted into space, but doesn't like to make public appearances. Here at the White House Rose Garden, the entire staff of the White House has come out to get a look at this first space-born astronaut of the United States. I thought that last Friday was a thrilling day. Today even surpasses last Friday. And as a matter of fact, I got far less sleep last night than I did the night before the flight. 
Thank you very much. As Kennedy made his little speech, as he got ready to present me with the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, it slipped off the box onto the deck, onto the floor. Jack Kennedy came up with the medal first, and he said, Shepard, he says, I present you this medal, which comes to you from the ground up, <laughs> which was a great line. Kennedy insisted prior to the parade that we return to the Oval Office for a meeting. He said, this is fantastic. Uh, what you've done is, is absolutely fantastic. What do you guys have planned for the future? And then he said, I want a briefing on this. And it was just three weeks after my 16-minute space flight when he announced, folks, we're going to go to the moon, and we're going to do it before the end of the decade. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single When I remember hearing uh, the speech and thinking to myself, my God, we have hardly begun to, uh, to walk here and this going to the moon is a, a tremendous Step. Everybody in the community thought he was nuts. He said that 20 days after Al Shepard flew in May, and we hadn't even put anybody in orbit yet. ...daring flight. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. If we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation. For all of us must work to put him there. Al's flight made a believer out of Kennedy. And that speech gave the whole country moon fever. All over America, people went to work on the moon shot. I don't know if anybody was a clock puncher. No matter what role they played, that was in the back of the mind, we've got that man to get to the moon. We practically had a big sign chiseled in the sky up there that said, waste anything but time. It was a matter of five to 20 insurmountable problems a day. We were literally writing the book as we went along. Working around the clock was our only hope. Feeling good about Al's flight didn't change the facts. It had taken us three years to get into space for all of 16 minutes. Now we had less than a decade to get to the moon. There was a lot of hard work going on in those days. But that wasn't all that was going on. Oh, and I remember another classic episode where we water skied in the surf, being pulled by a tow to a Chevy, a Carrie Corvette, right. Over the years, the military had assigned us to some of the most godforsaken spots on Earth. And at first, Cocoa Beach was no different. But once Kennedy pointed us at the moon, Cocoa Beach, Florida became Spaceport USA. We thought we'd died and gone to heaven. Cocoa Beach was a wild place. It was a wide open, raucous, frontier type existence. It was Boomtown. Uh, lots of pretty girls and lots of heroic men and abandoned. It was uh, like having magic goofus dust placed on your shoulder when they hung that title astronaut on you. There were women on the beach. They were there to have the attention of an astronaut. They wanted to befriend another astronaut, another astronaut, <laughs> and, you know, I used to say, well, they've got astronaut poisoning. There were ladies in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and probably other places around the country who liked to brag about how many or which different astronauts they had managed to slip into their bed. If they only knew that it wasn't all that difficult, <laughs> then they probably wouldn't have bragged that much. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. 
and no one ever said a word. No one had never gotten depressed and no one ever said a word. No matter how hard we partied, we couldn't keep the damn moon off our minds for long. All you had to do was step outside and take a look. There it was, waiting. We had to keep moving. Now we had two priorities. Prove that Al's success wasn't just dumb luck and get every Mercury pilot some space flight experience. Gus Grissom had won the second ride. We still didn't have a rocket with enough power to get into orbit, so Gus would make another suborbital flight just like Al's. Al's flight was perfect. Gus was out to do even better. Just because Al survived his flight didn't mean the next one would be a ride in the park. Gus knew the risks as well as anyone. For some reason, somebody decided they wanted to put a parachute in the cabin, so I was talking to Gus about it. He said, OK, we'll get it put in. I said, but I don't think it'll do you any good. I don't think you can get it on. And his, his retort was, well, it'll give me something to do until I hit. sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have to set. We have to We have to Gus flew a perfect flight, but after he splashed down, the hatch blew. The capsule filled with water and sank to the bottom. He almost drowned. I was just laying there minding my own business, and then, pow! The hatch went, I looked up, and I saw nothing but blue sky and water starting to come in over the sill. So I tossed my helmet off. My first thought was, get out. And the capsule actually sank and went below the water. And he was having difficulty uh, getting the capsule out of the water. He couldn't lift it. He ran into an engine problem. And uh, so I was getting water in the suit, and uh, getting lower and lower in the water all the time. I was having a fight uh, quite hard to stay afloat. Instead of a Washington parade, Gus got a lot of questions he didn't like having to answer. Captain Griffin, did you feel you were in danger in the water or any kind of flight? Well, I was scared a good portion of the time. I guess this is a pretty good indication. You were what? Scared. <laughs> OK. There it was. He said it out loud. He was scared. Of all the feelings astronauts weren't supposed to show, fear was number one. We knew he didn't blow the hatch, but there was no stopping the rumors now. But Gus's flight wasn't all we had to worry about. We hadn't even orbited yet, and the Russians sent up their second orbital flight. Newspaper headlines tell the story. Hermann Titov of Russia returns to Earth after orbiting the globe 17 times in a little more than 25 hours, covering 435,000 miles, which is more than twice the distance from the Earth to the moon. An orbit by a US astronaut is planned later this year. Later this year, the same old story. Russians in the lead and we're dragging. It was getting to be a habit with us. The embarrassing truth was, we weren't going anywhere near Earth orbit this year or any year. Not until we had a new booster. The Redstone we were flying was reliable as hell, but it didn't have enough power. There was no way around it. To reach the moon meant reaching orbit. The only thing we had to do that was Atlas. And Atlas was one bad news booster. This was the only rocket we had to get into orbit. And this was the man who was going to ride it. And so one day I ran into this thing, I think it was in Reader's Digest, and I came in and put it up on the blackboard in the room that we all shared. <laughs> and it was the definition of a sports car, an emotional hedge against the male menopause. <laughs> <laughs> There's a brand new bunch of astronauts, and we're going to 
go down. It's supposed to be a big confidence builder to let us see a big booster take off. So we go down, and it's a beautiful, clear, starry night. And so this thing lights off, and the the uh, hold down bars pull back, and and uh, the thing starts up. And so theatrical, anyway. Just the nature of it looks like it was staged by Hollywood or by Disney or somebody, you know, with the searchlights, and it's it's uh, quite impressive. And uh, it. We're watching the thing go, and up it goes, and we're watching it hit a high Q, hit the high Q point up there, and instead of going on through it like it was supposed to, it blew. And it looked, it looked like an atomic bomb went off right over us. So we all look at each other, you know, and that's the thing we're supposed to ride, you know? So we had a few discussions with the engineers after that. So they went back, and in, in fact, Deke was, uh, Deke was uh, the one who followed, in particular, the booster uh, problems that we were having. Problems like that, I didn't have to follow too close. I could see them from the next state. But we were in a race, and the other side was winning. Underneath our astronaut exteriors, we were still fighter pilots. NASA could worry about the Atlas till the cows come home. To us, the situation was pretty damn simple. There was a mission to be flown. It was dangerous. If John didn't make it, there'd be six of us left. And don't kid yourself. As soon as the funeral was over, we'd be lining up to take the next ride. That's the test business. <laughs> 